Hi everyone, welcome to the first episode of the Modern Golden Age podcast and I'm beyond excited to, to have with me Norman Sheila. Norman is a prolific podcaster, he's a true polymath, which is something that I want to talk about and it's, it's a real pleasure to, to be here with you Norman, thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, no, pleasure to be here and uh, happy to help out with seeing this show grow. So yeah. Thank you. Uh, I'm just excited, you know. <laughs> yeah, it, it makes two of us. So I, I want to start with, with a little story because um, when I started to, to build this podcast, uh, I, I, I was inspired by this meme uh, that most of our corner on Twitter knows, which is this meme from Visa with all these dominoes aligned, which if we tackle them all, we get to the golden age of, of humanity. And the first time that I started, that I saw that it, it, it moved me. I understood that I wanted to be part of that journey. Uh, and what I could do to do it is I'm a very curious person about almost any topic. And I realized that I could, my own contribu contribution to that journey would be, I can talk to different people and try to, to ask them questions and try to connect them in, in, in ways that otherwise maybe they shouldn't be connected. One of my great goals with this podcast is being able to talk with you and then one day talk with a person that you may not know, but I think that you'll click and try to make all these introductions. And so I was, after getting to the concept of the podcast, after thinking this through, uh, after thinking about the, the guests that I wanted to bring, I was paralyzed by fear. And I was, it, 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 it took me a long time to actually get the courage to start uh, talking with people and start DMing. And I, I had like all this self-sabotage and I was saying things like I should probably learn how to speak English even better and people will talk way better than me, all that stuff. And so I was paralyzed. And then I stumbled across uh, upon your anti flu podcast, which is something that surprisingly I had never heard. And you have like this quote, it's not exactly like that, but it's something in the lines of, I play the fool so you don't have to. And boy, that really opened my mind. I, 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 I just, I, for real, for real, I, I realized that, well, sure, I'll play the fool by not articulating like the right sentence or saying the right word. But maybe if I play my cards right, I'll probably, I, maybe I'll ask a question that allow for the guest and for everyone listening to have an insight. And I'm willing to play that. So that made it click. That made me start to, uh, reach out to people you included and start this podcast. So the first thing that I want to say is I, I just want to say thank you and how grateful I am for all the content that you put out, man. It's really, really, it was really important for me. So thank you. Uh, yeah, and I appreciate that. I, <laughs> it's um, the thing is with Antifool, what I think I had a similar realization or barrier when I started the show because I thought about like the, the premise for Antifool or at least the the origin of it was that it was a derivative of a formula for interviewing people from another show that I do but that had a specific niche that's about podcasting in Asia but as you know just like yourself I'm a very curious person I started to broaden my interests and curiosities to all sorts of places all sorts of people and I wanted I needed a vessel to articulate that and Antifool became that that show like that mission that purpose express in a way where everybody else can also um go on this journey with me mm -hmm. the funny part about this about that quote or like that phrase you mentioned this phrase it can be emulated by everybody and you're like a living example of it right it's like hey if you if you see me stumble and successfully and maybe even fail to a certain extent, um, interview all sorts of people and then put them on a show and you're enjoying the experience and all of a sudden every single episode in the intro, I'm inviting you as a listener to also do something similar. Yeah. Can you be the expressor of a message that you can control, you can hold, you can create, you can express, you can distribute, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for people who, who resonate with you yeah. in your own way. So I guess I also have to say thank you for letting me know that to a certain extent, my show has visible impact because that means a lot to me. Yeah, that's, that's fine. So um, you're, you're in Malaysia, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's probably it's something along like 4 p.m. there, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's 4 p.m. Yeah, because I had like this crazy idea 
when I first started about uh, thinking about interviewing, which is you have like this YouTube video called Drunk Rome with me, where you had a, a, a couple of, of bottles of sake, I think that's how, how you say it, and, and then you just roam around. <laughs> and I, I, I love that video and I thought, well, this should be an awesome way to do an interview. Like I would bought a, a bottle of sake, I would send some to Norm, and we just had, had a drink and talk. The problem is it's 9 a.m. here. And even though I like the premium lifestyle, I'm not that comfortable in drinking so early. But I, I want to ask you, this is my first real question, like how did that idea of the, the Rome With Me uh, video start? Because it, it's it's awesome content. The first time that I saw it, I, I actually tweeted you and said that I loved it because it, it, it just allowed me to understand better how Rome works, but also how your own thinking works. And I think that you're a guy that, things really well so that was a really good content but how did that start sure so the room with me was the combination of this one session that i had when i was note taking on various things you, you could start to tell where my hobbies and my vices are um i started watching a lot of live streams like of like games and like you know twitch streamers and stuff like that and during this time i was also working on Rome FM, which is the podcast with like people who use Rome, um, talking with other knowledge workers, thinking about different thinking patterns. How do you articulate such things? And someone brought up game film on a tweet. Mm -hmm. So I believe this was, I'm going to pull back my memory pause. This was Joel Chan and Joel Chan, who is one of the guests for that show, talked about game film. And game film is the concept where where athletes in a high competitive sport, like for example, tennis, would look at previous recorded matches of their opponents and of themselves, AKA game film, mm -hmm. to analyze it, to deconstruct it. And then to, to do some base, like basically do some shadow boxing, like you're immersing mm -hmm. yourself within that world of that recorded moment. And from there you start to embody all the the muscle twitching, the, the, the bouts of tension, the, the decision-making, maybe you'd pause after a specific hit and you're like, okay, if I was the player here and I'm going to reply back or I'm going to respond, do I smash on the top left of the court or do I do a drop ball in the front? So mm -hmm. you can pause, you can rewind, you can fast forward. And as they brought up game film, I was thinking like, what about note-taking game film? Does that exist? Mm. The closest is is uh, Andy Matuszczak, which is a notable name uh, in the Tools for Thought community. He, he's, his notes are always growing. And sometimes he would also do something similar where he would be live streaming a lot. Mm -hmm. So there's his channel where he would do some like YouTube lives there as well. In my head, I was like, okay, I, I watched some of his stuff and I found that I disagree with some thinking patterns from him, which is good. It's a good thing. I'm not saying anything bad about it. This experience mm -hmm. is good. I learned a lot because I found a lot of disagreements because by witnessing how someone else works, I find out more about how I myself work. Mm -hmm. And through that, I decided, okay, what if I tried to do something like this myself and just throw it out there and see how people react? Mm -hmm. So I did start a, I, I started a Rome Live. I didn't have the name Rome with me yet. I, I haven't thought about the name yet. So I just started, I, I turned on YouTube live and I was just like okay hi whatever 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 first ever uh topic and I didn't know how to format it at all I was just like let me just yeah. think a lot because that's actually how I think as a note taker right I don't yeah. actually have an itinerary I don't like schedule like okay let's think about let's think about Zettelkasten from 3 to 4 p.m no yeah I'm not like that uh <laughs> so uh but to give some level of constraints because there has to be some kind of to make a live worth it you have to have some level of uh, conclusion mm -hmm. so i wrote an agenda like a thinking agenda like mm -hmm. these are the things i will be tackling point a point b point c and let's dedicate x amount of minutes for each point and from there i'll be honest from there i don't remember what i did <laughs> so that's how okay. i that's how i think right so yeah. every room with me is me telling myself this is the agenda and no. then i start from point a and then i start so when that happens, and then from there all the way up until the end, I'm talking to a microphone. There's actually no one there except maybe someone in the chat box, right? I'm talking to myself in a room, mm -hmm. which I do. I do a mm -hmm. lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I 
I think I talked about that a lot. I, I did an interview before where I called myself a mad scientist. Like that's yeah. pretty much what I do. I talk to myself a lot. I have that all recorded and I just show my screen. And as I'm showing my screen, I have things that I normally don't say out loud, but I do say it out loud for a recording where mm -hmm. I justify and rationalize where the outlines go. Why is this yeah. sentence bolded? Why is this block reference, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. That led to some interesting talks with a few other people who saw the video and they're like, oh, I never thought about it that way. Thank you for yeah. the experience. So that's how that started. And then that's how it evolved slowly over time. Yeah. And now it becomes this, now it's become this, um, you can think of it as building an extra room in the house for thinking. Mm -hmm. It's an extra room that I walk into, I schedule to walk into this room to think about something. And because I know that it's live stream, I won't be distracted by anything else. I won't like doom mm -hmm. scroll on Twitter or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's where it is right now. Yeah, awesome. And and what you just said, like the nuances of you justifying, like why am I putting this on bold or why am I tagging this with that hyperlink? Um, it's, it's it's something that for the viewer, it really, when, as as I was saying, it really helps to understand how you think and and thinking patterns and thinking in general is some it's something that. I believe you're deeply interested in, um, and and to me, one of the principles that um, I believe will make us um, achieve like this modern golden age is is to think better, and that's why I'm always trying to realize different uh, thinkers and how I can learn from them. Uh, and and I'll, I'm really curious about how what are some of your own thinking principles that you have to think better. And I don't know if that's related or not, but you have like this, um, I don't know, like approach to thinking, which is uh, thought mind. And I would really love for you to talk a little bit about that as well. Um, so first question is, what are some of your principles in thinking? And then talk a little bit about thought mind. Oh boy. Uh, I feel like if you ask me this question like multiple times, I'll give you a different answer um, because it, it really is dependent on what you actually, what I'm actually focusing on. But here's some general parts, uh, general answers, I guess, to, to cover it. Thinking patterns are very organic to me. They're very malleable. So they mold according to what's needed of the, the thought in question, whether it's, oh, I have a problem, I need to solve it. So immediate, immediately when you say that sentence, the constraints are visualized and you can easily as a human being judge whether a potential answer is a good one, a bad one, a right one, a wrong one. Yeah. On the other hand, if it's something that's more open, something that's intangible, something that does not have a set conclusion, something where the answer cannot be articulated in just one sentence, there are many. So if the answer is plural, that's when that kind of thinking doesn't work. So you can think of this as a toolbox of different tools, one thinking pattern for one type of uh, uh, problem to solve. Mm -hmm. In the case, the second one, which I think is probably more of your interest, what happens then is that you're on a goal, your, your goal is to be on the path to seek the semantics of the answer you're looking for. Mm -hmm. To reach the end of a problem, to reach the answer, you have to find the words for it. And that sounds very woo-woo, very mystical, but it is quite true to a certain extent, especially when there are different mediums of exploring thought within someone's mind. Mm -hmm. The first medium you can think of is a question. If your question is expressed properly, you are already well on your way to answering the question. Yeah. Through your question, you can define the constraints, you can define what's acceptable. You can define the level of success. You can also define other factors that are involved in the answering of this question. All of a sudden, you're rebuilding an entirely new world within the confines of that question. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of my time is spent crafting questions, like building up questions. I call it gunpowder, but I think uh, it's part of the thought mind, which I explained a bit. Um, a lot of it is gunpowder that I'm putting up for attention and then throwing it away because I lost interest in it or putting up for attention because it's related to what I'm reading right now. Mm -hmm. To guide me through that, because it's such a chaotic system, I developed something called the thought mind. The thought mind is an analogy where all writers, all thinkers are blacksmiths of thinking. Mm -hmm. 
a blacksmith of thought. And every day you go into a mine, like I'm not talking about your brain. I'm talking about like your mind, like a metal, like iron mine, a mine where you go in and you try to pick at any metal, any iron, any copper, whatever that's useful. You take it out and then you temper it in your mind. There's full of rocks you're not going to need. There's going to be some gold that's going to be very, very valuable, but you will need to spend every day picking at the cracks, at the walls, all the way until you can find something may be useful. And then you take it out and then you put it into your forge, or in my case, it's Rome, and you play around with that. What can you make out of that? What can you build out of that? What are some other angles am I not considering? And to step away from that analogy a bit, it means that all of my notes are incomplete, progressive, and never concluding. They're all paused. Mm. They're all indefinitely paused. So if something, if there's a thought that I have already concluded, it doesn't actually mean, in my head, conclusion doesn't mean it end. It ends. It means that it, it's just paused. It's on, it's frozen. It's saved. So every single piece of thinking that I pull out of my mind is an or. When I forge it into my frameworks, whether it's my principles, whether I play a game of um, applying this insight into a completely different context and thinking what could go wrong? Like that's actually a legitimate thing that I would do, right? Um, literally like the kid who would like put a square block into a circle hole as a toy. You know, I'd actually do that. I do that on purpose, right? Because mm -hmm. I do that. I imagine a lot in my head. I'm in my own head a lot of times. I do that. And until I have a certain level of confidence in a specific thinking or line of thought, that or becomes an alloy. Mm -hmm. And once I can apply it or, or shall we say, articulate it into a specific context, once I can actually express it in something that is um, a package that people can experience, like a blog post that becomes a weapon. So mm -hmm. all ors turn into alloys, turn into weapons. And any spark of interest is a gunpowder. So yeah. any question, like if you ask me a question right now, it would spark a prompt. It's a prompt, right? It spark. It will spark a thought in me to explore as many words as possible. Mm -hmm. And like I said before, if the end goal is semantics, your goal now is for anything that you do from now on, when you're thinking, you want to find the right words for it. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of words in this case is that words in a specific combination trigger a specific amount of understanding. Yeah. So once you are confident enough that these combinations of words are appropriate, then, then you would have found your answer. Yeah. The best part about this is that for myself, and I think this is when it gets a little bit crazy or strange or trippy, not all of my answers make sense for a normal conversation. Mm. Sometimes it's a drawing. Sometimes mm. there's me singing out loud. Sometimes it's a dance. Sometimes it's poetry. Sometimes it's rhyme schemes. Like what if I try to answer a question about, about grieving over the loss of a friend and the only way for me to do that is through rhymes mm -hmm. or rhythm and poetry or mm -hmm. a song or a, a minor key, like yeah. something weird like that, right? Yeah. So you take all these materials that, that have different mediums and you try to slot them in and you're like, does this work? No, try again. Does this one work? No, try again. And you do this over and over and over again, almost obsessively. Yeah. <laughs> and then that's, uh, that's pretty much who I am and how I think in a nutshell. Yeah, so that's so interesting. Have you ever been comfortable with that? Like, or or have, have you ever tried to push? Because like, it's, it's so interesting. There's, there's a part of me, I always say this, I, I, I come from a background of music and I, I learned how to play the guitar. The guitar was my best friend for years and years and years. And there's a part of me that I feel that I can only express through the guitar. So there, there's things that I want to say with, to people that, and, and I do this, for instance, I do this a lot with my girlfriend. So I'm, there's things that I want to say to her that I cannot find the right words but if you give me a guitar, I'll play you the melody that I want you to listen to. Uh, and, and, and so to me, the, the fact that you're saying that some things, uh, some conclusions of, of your own thoughts go in, into a drawing or into, a, or into poetry or into uh, a song, that makes total sense. But my question is, have you, have you 
always been comfortable with that. And what I mean is like following a thought and then realizing that, well, actually my conclusion to this thought or my weapon to this line of thought will not be a blog post, but will be like a dance or, or, or a song. How did you develop that awareness of, of different vehicles for your own thoughts, for expressing that, that those thoughts? The developing the awareness part, I think that's heavily in line with the hobbies that I have. So like mm. I dance, I do capoeira, I also play guitar. Um, like the, the mediums of expression mm. in all of its forms are normalized in my, like to me. Mm. So I've already embodied them. Yeah. So it, it's actually, I, I, I think I came to the realization early on, even before finding out about Roma or whatever, I already came to the realization that not all answers need words. Sp sorry, sorry. Not all mm. answers need spoken words. Mm. So if, say, for example, there's an answer to your question and I can only do so by playing the guitar. Mm. I, can, I cannot say to you the answer, but I can play to you a melody. Mm -hmm. To me, the way to express that mode of intention is that... I have decided that the limits of language, of spoken language, are a detriment to my intention. Mm -hmm. Therefore, my thoughts are now externalized from the limits of my bodily vessel. If you think about it, all spoken language, all human language, etc. It's just it's just this organ right here talking, right? It's just your yeah. it's just your throat just like vibrating. And then your mouth is just moving in different different shapes. And all of a sudden, when I say, you know, when I say apple, suddenly you visualize the fruit in your head, right? Yeah. So these weird wind noises coming out of my, like a hole in my head, suddenly can help you with visualizing all imagery. So if you think about it that way, how different would it be if it was a song being played on guitar? Yeah. And once you've realized that, you're like, oh, okay. Um, certain dances can evoke specific emotions. Certain yeah. songs can make you cry, right? If a, if a singer sings a really high note, a very powerful note, if an opera singer sings like, you know, the highest note ever, you, your soul will be so shaken that you will, your, your body will actually respond. Yeah. Absolutely. And you don't have the words for it. Realizing that in all of creative work, in all of collective humane art, early on has one made me not depend on words all the time. Like I'll, I'll mm -hmm. use it as much as I possibly can, but then my identity isn't tied down to the words that I used. Mm -hmm. right? And two made me really appreciate non-spoken mediums more like yeah. dance and guitar, etc. So sometimes, you know, sometimes I think to myself when I'm thinking in Rome, I'm like, you know, I wish I could dance this block. Because mm. the words I'm finding here is like not enough. Like, mm -hmm. like, because the, the problem with the, what I, what I was saying about before about semantics is most of the time you're just trying to convince yourself again of what you're trying to remember, right? Mm. Like what you're trying to accept, et cetera, your beliefs. And sometimes, sometimes no matter, even if I choose perfect words, sometimes they're not enough because they don't elicit the feeling. Mm. So there's that to worry about, but no, I'm, I'm already very, very comfortable with, with, with medium being universal, and so is the message. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So you you clearly have like this uh, really strong relationship with um, I call it deep thinking. So like the the the, the act of not just thinking the thoughts, <clears throat> sorry, thinking the thoughts in your own head, but then try to digest them and to articulate them in the best way. Like, how did you start that? Have you always been like that ever since you were a child? Was there a specific moment where you started to, to, to turn into this deep thinking? How's that journey? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I don't have a set like checkpoint or pinpoint for you, but um, there are some, shall I say, factors. Like mm -hmm. I grew up Malaysian, um, native family here, indigenous, and then we moved to Europe for a couple of years. So there's yeah, this- To Netherlands, right? Yeah, to Netherlands, yeah, to Den Haag. Um, so when I moved there, there's this huge disconnect between me and 
and the people around me. Like even before then, if I remember correctly, and if my family told me about this later on, I was always a very quiet child. So they weren't, they weren't really sure there was something wrong with me or I had any mm. problems or, or if I do have desires, I wasn't expressing them enough. Mm. So, so they were trying their best to like, you know, you know, poke me to do things, you know, um, and then moving to Europe and all of a sudden the second layer of disconnection came with differences in cultural nuances, differences in backgrounds and differences in all these people from different walks of life. Oh, I you? realized, so, oh. um, I, I moved when I was 10 years old. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I started to realize that when I want to fit into society as a concept, I'm putting air quotes here. I needed to understand all of these varieties. I need to understand all these differences. Deep thinking ended up becoming a tool for survival. Mm -hmm. I needed to know how, you know, I, I went to a British school. I needed to know how British school worked. I needed to know how like British school children also interacted like socially in terms of, you know, mental capability and, and uh, interactions and verbal cues and stuff like that. What do they mean when they say yes? What do they mean when they say no? All those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And Clashing that with previous values living back in Malaysia had let, resulted in this really weird gray zone that I live in in my head where I'm always spending every day translating interactions with people mm. since I was 10 years old, which is a very, very, very long time, like literally every day translating. And for a lot of people, maybe they won't have you know, they won't put that much like energy into that. But for me, it was actually quite a big ordeal because I didn't want to be uh, left out of things. I didn't want to be alone. I didn't want to be abandoned, that sort of thing. Uh, so all those thoughts came up. So when the deep thinking became a necessity, when I started pursuing my interest from then on. So I was really interested in this collection of, of comics to teach kids about science. It's called the Horrible Science Series. And I loved science at the time. So I was just like going through that. And it was really funny. Like I love comics. Like so at yeah. the time. So I was like reading it and I was learning all these things. And there's this curiosity for learning all about all, all forms of science, you know, from like chemistry to biology to whatever. And that actually shaped my semantics. Mm. Art, like learning how to analyze things, learning how to figure out and find out more about what happened here and there. And I started applying a parallel of what I've learned from these books onto the people around me. So I became relatively sensitive to social cues and interactions. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a double-edged sword. Sometimes I become a little bit too um, hesitant to act because I don't know if maybe the behavior of this person acting this way, it's either them being indifferent to what I've said or them being extremely offended by what I said because I've seen both. Yeah. Like I've seen both like results. So like it, it, that's, that's, that's what makes it really, really difficult. Um, yeah. And then as a result, like deep thinking is such a, is such a humane and uh, it's such a humane personal activity, but it's derived from social interactions. Like mm -hmm. the, the pillar of deep thinking is like, no, not many people know that the materials built to building like, the materials to hold up that pillar of deep thinking revolve around your interactions with people. Yeah. Like the, the people who hold you up, like the, the, you know, the, the giants that you stand upon, whose, mm -hmm. whose shoulders you stand upon, all of a sudden you indirectly taking their experiences, their thoughts, their insights, and then you build this own room for yourself. Yeah. But your room for yourself is to a certain extent derived from all yeah. these things. So yeah, yeah that's how it's. Yeah, and, and you're included there, I, I suppose, like um, the interactions that you have with, with a book or with a podcast or, or just social interactions. Because to me, whenever I think, like, I, I don't know who said it, but ever since reading that book, it, it changed the way I read books, which was something like, uh, whenever I read a book, I, I tend to, I'm, I, I'm having a conversation with the author. And so I'm discussing the topics that he, he, he's presenting. And ever since, because I used to, this is really bad for me to admit, but but it's true. I used to read the books and just meet them at face value. And and there was a moment where I just started to, well, what if I'm having a conversation with this person? Like, what questions would I like to ask them? 
I, and where do I disagree with them? And so I, I, I to me, what, what you're saying makes absolutely sense. And I also consider all these non-direct um, conversations, let's call it that way, as a way to, to, to build that pillar that supports deep thinking. Do you agree with this? Yeah, I do. I do. Um, conversations, the, the thing is, like now we're speaking about the definition or the universal like the universal element of conversation yeah um i always like to say everything is a conversation like whether you're mm. you're you're speaking of insight of like you're, you're looking out on the window right yeah you're at you're describing like hey what's what's outside the window there's birds flying the clouds are nice and all and yeah. the grass is green whatever one you um the outside world is speaking to you of what you are noticing two you're telling yourself and expressing what you are taking in what you're perceiving yeah. so if everything is a conversation then you're speaking with perception yeah. and when you're speaking with perception it doesn't matter what the medium is if it's a youtube video if it's a podcast if it's a book if it's like some you know a couple of dudes talking about some random thing at a coffee shop nearby and then you're just like sitting there and you're like what are they talking about but then yeah. all of a sudden yes you are having a conversation with them it's merely what we talk about when it's just specifics now. It's it's yeah. talking about whether there is uh, reciprocity. So yeah. if you know someone is actually sending something to you back, or are you saying something to them? Yeah. Like if I were to take a book and I would read it, and I'm speaking, I'm thinking about the author, I'm talking to the author, and I'm like, okay, maybe I disagree with you here, but that's okay. That's that's fine. Whatever, whatever. Uh, yeah. This is also very bad to admit on a recorded episode, but I I write in my books. Like oh, I, I, I buy I, books and I write in the margin. Yeah, me too. I, so. I, I highlight, I highlight, I write, I draw, right? Yeah. I, I write my secrets. You're in a safe space. Like, yeah, I write my secrets. Uh, yeah, no, yeah, don't worry. Don't worry. There, there's, maybe there's only like a couple of million people that's going to listen to this episode. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, so there's all of a sudden, we're going to have conversations with everybody. The only difference is how these conversations are realized. That's it. Yeah. Right? And the best part about this, the best example is if you just go back like 200 years ago or something, how do people from one side of the world to the other talk with each other? Letters. Yeah. They just write a really, really long, like almost like a blog post, right? Like imagine yeah, yeah, writing yeah, yeah. a private blog post or something. Yeah. And you send, uh, you know, you, you know, you lick the top of the envelope, you close it and then you put a stamp and then you send it all the way. And then all of a sudden it's like all the way out from the US to Asia or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they receive a private blog post. It's it's a conversation. Everything is a conversation. Yeah. And it doesn't matter what the medium is. The only difference and probably a challenge here, the only challenge is your ability to perceive at different layers of messaging, the different channels where noise can potentially come in. Yeah. And as an example of this, you, if you take two videos where two people are talking about something interesting and uh, it's like a lecture, I don't know, from two professors, they're talking about the exact same thing. The only difference is that in the second video, there's like a monkey dancing to like techno music, right? That's noise, but yeah. it's part of the messaging of that second video. Yeah. You don't want to be distracted. It's the same thing here. Can you filter out useless information, unnecessary information? Mm -hmm. Can you focus on the insight? Can you articulate and express and respond back um, gracefully, of course, gracefully? And out of this entirety, this interaction, does it serve you? Yeah. And that's pretty much the yeah. the thing, the metric, right? The metric yeah. of usefulness yeah. for every conversation. That's, that's a great question. So, uh, like, uh, how did you develop the way um, or techniques, principles, I don't know, that allow you to cancel the noise in, in such conversations? Um, hmm. That's actually a great question because I don't know if I can articulate it right now, but let me try, mm. right? Version one, version one. Yeah. And if anything, if I write any more about this, I'll, I'll definitely credit the episode. Okay. So um, developing the skill to filtering out noise is part of what I call a mental filter. Mm. A mental filter is essentially the manipulation of one's perception. If I open a book and this book, was a secondhand book about like, you know, 
like some philosophy, something really interesting, whatever. But a child took the book and then like draw like doodles all over it, right? Like maybe it's like a Superman fighting Batman or whatever. It's all over the thing, okay? The simplest application of a mental filter is if you just ignore the doodles and you read the book. Yeah. Right? And of course, like, you know, damage notwithstanding on the book, if you, if you can't see the words, then obviously, of course not, right? Um, but a mental filter is something that's more internalized. When you hear someone calling out to you for help, if they're complaining about their day, if they are in need of your assistance, all of a sudden you start to filter out the emotion and mm -hmm. you logically analyze what do they really need. Mm -hmm. Now, responding gracefully is a whole other topic altogether, but I'll, so I'll just focus on that first part. But when you train this skill, this skill comes from really active, intentional listening, mm -hmm. crafting and taking your time to ask the right questions to continue the conversation, and knowing what would, um, shall we say, affect your mental psyche drastically mm. and putting a barrier to that. Then you'll know what starts to work. And this, you know, this really is subjective, right? For example, for myself, I, I love my friends, I love my family, etc. but I can't handle negativity too much. Mm. I can't handle it. So for me, a way to protect myself is even if I have the, the intention of wanting to help someone by, you know, um, by uh, listening to their story or hearing out what happened, etc. I can't let that affect my, you know, my emotional state. Mm -hmm. So if they're going through something, the filter will be there to remind me every time this problem is not mine. I'm here to save or I'm here to support the person, but I am not involving myself emotionally in the problem. Mm -hmm. I am merely an outlet living outside of the box of which this context exists mm -hmm. and reminding me that every single time. Mm -hmm. And so once you realize that that's the, the format, the shape that conjures up when you're talking to someone and they're sharing something really, really heavy with you, yeah. you'll start to realize how, how weightless and fleeting the emotions actually are once it reaches you. If someone were to reach out to me to talk about the, um, the loss of their pet or something like that. And of course, I'm going to feel really saddened because, you know, I have pets too. I, I, I get really sensitive about that. It is not my pet. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have to be sad for them. Yeah. But I should, as a friend, be there to give the emotional support if need be. Yeah. So when I ask myself, what do I want to be in service of this person who I care for? I want to be someone who they can trust and they can, um, they can seek assistance from um, whilst protecting my own boundaries, my own bastion of security mm -hmm. and emotional state. Mm -hmm. Training that every day with people, with all sorts of articles, information, etc., realizing it makes you start it may it starts to help train your filter your filter is quite formless it really just depends where you are going to be most of the time and there are tangible ways of actually building it really easily things mm -hmm. like you know blocking certain sites that are too negative for you cutting off certain social medias if it's just too much overwhelming mm -hmm. etc you start to feel not selfish because that's negative connotation there you start to feel a lot more confident in what you want mm -hmm. because you have greater clarity in what you want Mm -hmm. And when you have greater clarity in what you want, you are starting to answer the question of what do I want for myself whilst protecting myself? And the answer then is going to be this million answers, but there's going to be one answer that's applicable for every situation. So yeah. you build that. It's another set. Of, it's another toolbox, right? Yeah, it's a yeah. toolbox to protect yourself. And it's also a toolbox to also be empathetic at the same time. Mm -hmm. If necessary, you can turn it on, turn it off. Mm -hmm. And yeah. yeah, that that's how I would answer the question. Um, yeah. But of course, do you have like specifics and nuances that no, it, get it, too complicated? It, yeah, no, it, it makes a lot of sense because first I was I was thinking about noise as purely uh, like from a, a distraction point of view, like how to cancel that noise. 
I, and I love that you went to the emotional side of it because because it is nice as well, right? I, I totally get what you're saying. Like when someone comes with you, like I used to do these corporate training gigs, um, and one of the things that a lot of people uh, came to me with problems, especially managers, was something like, "Well, I want to um, help like this guy that I'm working with, but he he's just he let's say he's just sad or he's just angry, and I come from a place of of peace." And whenever I try to talk with them, it just we just clash. And and one of the yeah. the, the things that we used to 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 give those managers the, the tool was well, you need to understand that you need first to help someone. You need to put yourself as at the same mental state as he is, so he feels listened and heard to him, and he feels empathy. But to do it in a, in a pure rational way, so you don't feel those emotions like. If someone's angry, like you probably have this experience, like when when you're angry and someone just if someone comes around, just say relax, everything's going to be okay. Like people get even angrier because that's so yeah, yeah. different from what you feel, right? But if you come in and 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 just try to 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 like feel what you think, well, you're you're angry. Well, why are you? Oh, yeah, I, I totally get that. Absolutely, that makes it makes all the sense that you're like that, but. Maybe if you think about it this way, and then you slowly guide the conversation to the the real emotion that you're feeling. But maybe you need to um, to to first feel that emotion that he's that he or she is feeling as uh, in that in that moment. And what you're saying, like having this filter where you keep repeating to yourself, like I'm I'm not this problem. Well, I, I'm 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 just uh, 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 I'm I'm outside of. of the, the realm in, in this problem it makes total sense and, and it and it helps in this process you can empathetically and empathetically respond to, to to the person without having to feel those emotions and so one of the things that you actually said in that answer was how to graceful respond uh and i would love for you to, to riff a little bit on that like what's a graceful uh response uh, to you oh my, um, <laughs> I say graceful response. Uh, sometimes it's a hit or miss because like you said, uh, the circumstances can be so different that even if you state with total empathetic intentions, sometimes it might just be a miss. Maybe yeah. they just don't want to hear that kind of response. Um, most of the time, grace is needed under a very emotional charged event. When I say emotionally charged, I do mean in states of like, high tension, arguments, fights, someone is really, really mad, something like that, right? The first thing then is when you want to provide or send a graceful response, you must come from a state of grace. And when you come from a state of grace, the first thing is the state of grace means that you must have close to zero emotional charge from your end. Mm -hmm. If you are responding with emotional charge, then the person would think that your words, it doesn't matter what they are. You could have just been like, you know, the weather is great today. Like you could have just said something very, very simple like that. Yeah. And, 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 the, and the guy would, 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 would think that you're threatening him. Yeah. It, it could just be anger, right? When someone is in a state of being extremely emotionally charged, anything that even resembles their level of energy, they believe that it's a mirror reflection of their own state of mine, yeah. which is that they're angry. So yeah. someone who is relatively the same amount of charge, they're going to think like, oh, you know, they're like, you know, like completely blind with red eyes. It's just like, oh, you know, you're just as charged as I am. That means you're angry. And if you're saying yeah. something to me, that means you're angry at me. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. Miscommunication happens, like breakdown completely happens. A graceful response is one to take the brunt of that emotional charge and just say, hey, you know, I noticed you're angry. What's wrong? Or, hey, let's let's talk it up. What, what do you need? Or, yeah. hey, small suggestion leads to larger suggestion. Or, what do you think about this, 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 this? Mm. Right? These are small prompts to, one, give the person a chance to cool down naturally. Mm. Sometimes when we, when we say calm down, it's, it, it's more like we are assertively trying to force them to stop, mm -hmm. right? It's like using our words as hands and stopping them from vibrating. It's just like, yeah. like stop, calm down. And of course, 
we don't like being told what to do or we don't like being forced what to do. We're humans, right? We're sort of rebellious in that nature. Mm -hmm. How do you think we've evolved to all these society stuff? Um, so obviously that's going to be extremely, extremely unempathetic. That's going to be complete misunderstanding. And it is also a really cheap way of escaping yeah. what your responsibility is to do, which is to face and confront the situation in a graceful manner um, yeah. and, and neutrally figure out what to do next. Mm -hmm. You can't take away someone's anger in one go. The graceful response is small responses and answers and questions of what's happening. Can you tell me what's wrong? What should we do next? Do you feel better if this happens? Would it help you? Would it make you feel better if I do this, 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 this? Yeah. Hey, maybe right now you are in need of some direction and you can totally tell me if I'm wrong and you can totally correct me if I'm wrong and I will apologize for, mis for assuming this. But how about I help you by doing this, 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 this? Clarity is one of the ways to help with cooling down emotionally charged situations. Mm. Because most people who are in a state of emotional charge, they want resolution. Mm. They want solutions to something, right? Whether it's an argument, a fight, whether it's something really bad happened at work, and then they're like, ah, or, uh, or that they want to find a way to let out their outlet of complaining about their day. Yeah. Maybe in the end, they just needed someone to be their emotional standbag. Mm -hmm. And your goal then is to disconnect yourself for a bit, recognize, filter out all the emotional things, mm -hmm. and then maybe distract yourself in your head. I mean, some, I mean that's obviously can be, can be quite wrong and not as graceful of an answer uh, for myself. Uh, yeah. But I do do that uh, just, to, just to keep up, uh, just to cope with maybe yeah. something that's too overwhelming. But these are some example situations of what I found to work. Mm -hmm but not with 100% success. So yeah. for anyone listening, uh, um, just, just, I'm just letting that warning up there. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just be and, careful. <laughs> yeah, it should. It, it makes a little sense. So uh, let me just change a little bit of topics um, and, and to, to, to say that uh, you're a very prolific podcaster and, you, and, and like you have, you have like anti-fool, Rome FM, which by the way, changed the way I saw Rome. Uh, and it made me, and it made me just embrace it. Uh, but also, like you have these fiction stories, you have these um, interviews about Asian podcasts. Like you're very prolific when it comes, especially at least for what I've um, acknowledged of, of your content. You're very prolific when it comes to sound in, in the podcast. And uh, my question is, well, do you have any special relationship with sound specifically? Like there's, there's people that, that are a, a lot of, um, they do a lot of visual thinking and they express themselves a lot through visuals. Um, the, also there's people that, that do the same, but they're very sensitive and, and, and they value a lot like what sound is as a fundamental property of reality. So I was wondering, I'm, I'm really curious about what's your relationship with it? Huh. <laughs> I don't think I have an answer for this. Uh, the, the thing is with, with sound. So like, I don't know. I think a lot about my senses a lot. So mm -hmm. like eyes, nose, ears, you know, mouth, yeah. taste, you know, skin, contact, stuff like that. Whenever we think about memory, whenever we think about remembering something, we always remember immediately. The first thing is visuals. Mm -hmm. And when we remember things that have a taste component, like, oh, our favorite food when we were young, you can probably conjure it up um, from there. Yeah. The thing is, I sometimes don't trust my own senses mm -hmm. that in that when I'm trying to remember specific memory pieces, I don't know if I'm completely accurate. And one of my fallbacks, one of my worst ones is sound. I mm -hmm. can't remember exactly if this song that I really liked when I was young is actually exactly the song that I liked when I was young, I was actually very, very, I'm very unconfident, like not confident when it comes to remembering the past via oral cues, right? mm. via sound. So when, when I guess when you ask the question, I'm like, I don't remember what the past sounded like. Mm. So that's the first thing that comes to my mind. Um, and probably until, until when I moved to the Netherlands, I start, I start to remember things like, friends' voices or yeah. the sound of like cows or like horses. 
I mean, smell is definitely a big one because we, I mean, the school is next to a, a farm and there's horses. Oh my God, shit smells bad. But like the, <laughs> the sound, the sound was mainly from people's accents. So that was one that I thought of and became more sensitive to voices in general mm-hmm. and in general ambience. So that was the bedrock of my relationship with sound. And that grew over and over as I moved to country to country to country, mm-hmm. all the way up until, I guess, Japan. And in Japan, I was there for a year on exchange. This is 2015. And I started to realize that there are differences in the finer details of sound. After having lived in different countries, I'm like, oh, why does the city in Holland sound different than a city in Japan? Mm-hmm. Why, why does the murmuring of people talking to each other in a cafe sound different. Technically, it shouldn't be the same. It's just humans like blah, 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 blah in the background, right? But then you start to notice these like inner findings. I'm like, huh, I like this more. Or like, huh, I don't like this more. Like, Mm -hmm. it's just people talking. Like, they're not doing anything bad. They're just like, Mm -hmm. it's just background noise. And I start to have agreements, disagreements with sound. Mm -hmm. I don't don't actually consciously think about it, but I just start to have like subconscious agreements and disagreements and just arguments with sounds around me. Hmm. And the way that that's expressed is in how much I relax. Hmm. So if I am around or surrounded by sounds that I really like, my body relaxes more. Like I can actually feel my, my shoulders like hmm. relax more. There's like way less tension. So like continuing on from there, podcast became a thing. Like it came into my, my, my interest and now I could make it right? I can make an episode. So now the goal is not, hey, where can I find these sounds that relax me to how can I create a sound that relaxes me? To the point where despite the initial embarrassment of listening to my own voice, despite um, actually sharing with people like the rest of the world that I, you know, I create really weird ass characters uh, Mm -hmm. in this world, uh, in this show, the goal then is how can I relax myself through sound and how can I create that experience for myself? And it just so happens that I'm sharing that with the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. And the like podcasting the format ends up becoming that sharing the rest of the world part. Mm-hmm. But the intention is still there. Like this episode should be an episode that I am doing for myself first. Yeah. Like I'm kind of a selfish guy. Like I, I want to make sure that this is good for me uh, before mm-hmm. anything else. And I guess that's the relationship of sound. It's just like lots and lots of fights and agreements and disagreements. And I'm best friends with specific sounds. Mm-hmm. Like I love campfire, crackling fire sounds. Yeah. I love snowstorm sounds. I love yeah. the sound of, of, uh, of like opera. I love the sounds of this and that. And there are some people's voices who I really, really like. And mm-hmm. there are some voices who I really, really hate. Like, like I, I, I know someone who, I don't know them, but like I, I know of them where I've heard their voice and this is going to sound really assholey, but like I've heard their voice in the vicinity and I actually felt like throwing up. Like that was really, really weird. I've never mm. had that before ever in my life. Mm. And this person must be a nice person ever, but as soon as they open their mouth, I'm like, oh my God, no. So yeah, uh, really weird complexity there, but I guess that could be uh, an answer yeah. for the time. Being. It's, it's so funny because you started that with, with memory. Um, uh, like I, I was think when I asked the question, uh, my my mind was going to, to to the last part of your response, talking about podcasts and your relationship with it. But it's so funny you started with memory, and, and and you have this article in your in your website talking about it uh, about memory in general. And I don't remember the specifics, but I remember I, I opened the article, and there was and this happens a lot in your company. And there I was thinking about I, I was looking at this topic from a certain from a certain point of view. Um, and I opened that article and I was thinking like, I'll, oh, I'll read this because he will probably talk about how to memorize ideas and, and all that stuff. And you and you you say that, well, I think it's in the beginning of the article, something like, uh, I'm also afraid of forgetting the important conversations of my life. And when, yeah. and, 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 and when you write that, suddenly my worldview just collapsed and was rebuilt again, thinking, yeah, that makes total sense. Because... I never thought about it, but there's a lot of conversations throughout the years that had a deep impact on me. And some of them I remember, but there's a bunch of them that I don't. And sometimes I'm talking with people and someone says something and, 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 and suddenly I'm, I'm hit by, yeah, I once talked about even person about that. And the insight was this and that. And, and, and so I like, 
I I I, I wonder how where where does that come from? That sensibility to 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 conversation and and like no I I no let me just reframe that with a different question, which is how's your relationship with memory? Like how because because you you're also like a, a, a coach on memory. Uh, and so how, how did that relationship start and what do you value uh, in terms of remembering? Sure. Yeah. Um, so the article that you refer to, uh, I believe, I believe you're talking about the fear of forgetting essay. Yeah. That I brought up. Um, so that, that actually that article explains most of that part uh, because I, my relationship with memory is that because I've moved around so much, I don't have a concept of home. So staying within the confines of what I've done, what I've remembered, et cetera, felt more, helped me feel more at peace than anything else. Mm -hmm. So whenever I think of memory, I think of experiences that I really cherish. And all of those are, are, they're, they're all evidence that I have lived a life. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's a big, big, big deal because, I mean, as that essay said, I have a fear of forgetting. I have a fear of dementia. I have a fear of memory loss. It's like a really, really big sign that, like, I mean, like I've had like events where they're so, they're so hurtful that I actually forgot what happened months after. Like, I don't remember the year. I actually, I'll give you an, an, a genuine, honest, like, declaration here. I do not remember 2019. Like, mm. I, I don't know what happened in 2019. Like, it's actually just, just, that's just how bad it was because of something bad really happening. Yeah. My relationship with memory is one, from the basis of fear, mm -hmm. but two, from the basis of the hope for a life well-lived and that life well-lived was lived by me. So it's a legacy in a certain yeah. way. It's proof of legacy. And this continuation in wanting to create well, what I call cultural immortality it's, it's a way for you to, to, to set aside your ego and to imprint your time on earth for everybody to witness. Mm -hmm. Memory ends up becoming such a huge foundational part of that because, like we said before, all mediums are all like messages are universal. There's just so many different mediums. You're just picking the ones that you like the most. Yeah. But the end goal of that phase or that formula is the imprinting of set message into memory. Yeah. So it's yeah. just the bucket, right? Yeah, yeah, you yeah. want to, you want to embody the universe into you and you want to receive it and then let out a version of the universe with you having made a dent in it. Mm -hmm. And memory is proof that you've done that. Yeah. Yeah. It, That's it, my relationship. Yeah. It makes, it makes total sense to you. What what does a modern golden age resemble? Um, that's that's the one of the final questions that I have that I would love for you to to do riff on. Okay. Oh boy. Uh, I hope everyone here is taking notes because it's going to be pretty big. Um, so I talked about cultural immortality. That yeah. is my own personal goal. I I want to be able to articulate that that sentence that phrase. Cultural immortality, in a nutshell, is if I, I don't even have to give you a definition, I can just give you an example. Mm. Why do people still remember Leonardo da Vinci? Mm. Right? You, you yeah. don't have to answer now, all right? But just have that thought in your mind. Why? Is it his sketchbooks? Is it his art? Is it Mona Lisa? Did he invent something? He didn't invent anything, you know that? He was just exploring his curiosities. Yeah. In the height of the Renaissance era, he explored his curiosities. He went and painted and sculpted and did all sorts of random stuff. And now you see a little piece of him in every part of human history. When you think of art, Leonardo is not ignored. That's cultural immortality. He yeah. lives in memory. A modern golden age, to me, is when the unification of every human being on earth to help accelerate human progress, whether it's humanity through arts, humanity through science, etc., will result in them, in all of us, becoming immortal. 
Mm. Culturally, physically, mentally, you can you can define it how you want. Okay. Mm. And so when a modern global age, like the modern golden age, to me, there's a reason why it's called a golden age. A golden age is remembered. You don't yeah. just you don't just sound, it's not like a trend. It's not like a business trend. It's not like oh, it's Christmas week, right? Christmas sales. No, no, no. A golden age is remembered. A golden age is coveted. A golden age is respected, and a golden age is revered by the past, the present, the future. How grand is that definition? Okay, can you even imagine the weight of it? We'll get crushed by the expectation of such. A modern golden age is a golden age where, because everybody's working towards the same thing, yeah, semantics, conversations, articulations, expressions are all one hundred percent understood. Translation ceases to be a barrier. We can all fully understand each other, and when we can, and w- when I say understand, I also mean like you know backgrounds and cultural nuances and yeah. Stuff. Once that occurs, then the modern golden age is now not a golden age that exists only within the confines of one country or one culture. A modern golden age is global. Yeah, it's modern because. Physical tangibilities, like tangibles, like you know, country borders, right, regulations, etc., do not play a part, and they do not hinder the flourishing of humans within this era. Mm-hmm. So you can take that of that what you will, but essentially, to me, in a nutshell, I guess if you don't put it in one sentence, in a modern global golden age, if you have lived through a golden age, you are immortal. Yeah, that that, that makes a lot. It's so funny that you brought the vintage because um, I, I when I was because uh, to me he he he's one of the embodiment of, of the golden age and and uh, when I was uh, trying to understand when I'm, I was about when I was going to release the first episode of the episode zero where I present why am I creating this podcast I I I, I remember thinking like well maybe if the Vinci was born. Uh, in the beginning of, of a year, I'll, I'll release the first episode on its birthday, which is April 15th. So it's basically in, 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 in three days, recording this in, in the 12th. Uh, and so it, it was really fun. And that makes a lot of sense. Um, and and as, as you said, like, it's, it's this grandiose vision, and I love it. Let me ask you uh, uh, just a little, one or two more questions. So the first, is, it, the first one is, what are some of the principles that you believe we must um, follow in order to get uh, into that modern golden age. Like for me, there were two or three things. The first one is I believe that we need to, as a society, change uh, um, what I call uh, like the, the our values, beliefs, um, goals, and practices. Uh, I think that these four things are fundamental, need a fundamental change in order for us as a humanity to get into that golden age. And the second one is uh, and it was really fun, just uh, a side note. I remember when I was doing some research for our podcast, uh, I, I stumbled upon a, a photo that you posted on Twitter and with a, uh, a notebook and with a couple of notes. And one of them was uh, on, you, you written something on the lines of on defining what a sage is. And uh, here's uh, months later, I was writing about it and, and I like, I, I'll just go on understanding. So I believe that one of the ways that we can do in order to improve ourselves is, is to build these narratives around our own lives. And to me, I decided that 2022 would be like my redemption arc uh, year. And that was when I, I I was going to mix two things, action and magic. To me, action is doing, magic is thinking. And while I was looking for this, I, I realized that to me, a sage is someone who has both of these things, so both action and magic together and is, is able to embody them in, in one being. Uh, and so to me, those are two principles that I believe we need to the modern golden age. The, the change in values, beliefs, goals, and practices, and all of this, in, in, and also this integration of magic and action. I would love to, to listen to some of your own wisdom. Yeah, I mean, you've touched on a lot of that I would definitely agree with. Um, in my head, whenever I think about a golden age, you can see elements of these at smaller scales, but an age has different expectations. So I'm very particular about semantics in this regard because we now speak of a golden age that consists of multiple actors. 
actors from an international relations perspective consists of countries, regions, um, organizations that are results of collectives of different countries, et cetera, like nation leaders, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The complexity of running the world right now is so intense that it's become really, really difficult to find, say, acts of kindness consistently throughout the world. Maybe you, you find it in one region and then on another, you're having a war. Like that could be a you know total possibility, just like now, right? You never know, right? Yeah. So what now, when we see such, such things, we start to hold such a slight disdain about, oh, you know, our are we going to, uh, is the world going to be okay? And, you know, is there going to be a war, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all these negative thoughts. And yes, I do agree with what you're saying. However, I don't think that's enough for a golden age because a golden age starts with infrastructure and infrastructure is one that, to be honest, is just not talked about enough because a golden age cannot sustain the amazing benefits that it has for a whole population of intellectuals around the world, if the livelihood of such individuals is based upon current regulations, current ways of, of governance, yeah. current ways of doing trade agreements, current ways of interacting from culture A to culture B, current ways of viewing trends, of doing business, of, doing, um, of applying principles, the principles that you've said, how do we know that they translate well with regards to the demands and the inner workings of the population of a different country that you want to instill a global age in. Mm -hmm. If I, who is someone who wants to instill a global age, want to bring that into, say, another country nearby, am I imposing such principles, right? Mm -hmm. Am I even being um, uh, too assertive? Am I trying to overwhelm their narrative? How do we do that whilst not denying their narrative how do we yeah. include theirs into ours and create one where it's all organic so it's infrastructure mm -hmm. translation then becomes a possibility so i guess one principle that i would consider is the is 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 toppling the definition of nationality i i, I don't know how to word this at the moment i'll probably yeah. i actually this this episode is actually would be great um way to kick my ass because I do want to do a room with me about this. Mm. So in my head, the, 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 the phrase sovereign individual comes yeah. into play when trying to instill a global age. Someone who is not tied down to entities mm -hmm. that have any form of, of physical locale, like mm -hmm. the passport from, where, from which they were born on. Etc. They're able to go from anywhere and everywhere in the world, and to them now the world is their oyster. Yeah. A global age requires individuals such as these to actually help spread that that unification around. Yeah. So it's like a you can you can think of it as like like the diplomat for the internet, mm. right? If the internet is a country and this country is vying for world peace, and then the internet hires these diplomats to go all around the world. That's yeah. basically the sovereign individual, right? That, yeah. that, that's pretty much it. So the complete breakdown and reconstruction of nationality as a concept, the rise of the sovereign individual class mm. and an overhaul on relationships between, between the, the actor and the state for the future. Yeah. If you want to build a golden age, you would have to start realizing that it's that individuals are far more sought after than uh, by countries, yeah. than countries seeking for more individuals. Yeah. So you start to see that, that there's more like, um, what do we say this? How do we say this? A lot of this narrative and a lot of these semantics are based off of what the person's going to do yeah. more so than anything else. Yeah. If, for example, if, for example, we take a, a very famous writer uh, a very famous thinker, a very famous philosopher. They move from one country to the other. Einstein moved, yeah. right? Einstein moved from Europe to US. He emigrated, right? The region lost a genius and he moved. And because he had the sovereignty that there was demand for his presence, mm -hmm. that anywhere, any, any building that he stepped into, genius was being shared. Yeah. 
And that's what that's but a mere example of the possibility of a rise in a golden age where geniuses or geniuses, individuals, influential people can share that gift with everybody without any incumbents, without any barriers. Mm -hmm. So if you want to address the modern global age, you would have to start thinking about or addressing your relationship as an individual mm -hmm. with state actors at different locations. So yeah. I, I'm sorry, I don't think I have like a proper principle for no, this, but I think no. these are like, these are prompts to like consider. Absolutely, oh, yeah. that's that's awesome. And I'll, I'll definitely, I'll, I'll, I will think about this because you gave me a lot of thinking that answer. Now, and when I when I release season two of this podcast, I'll bring you on again, and we'll just discuss <laughs> this this part of infrastructure. Norm, um, I I we're 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 talking uh, we're past our time, but I really I wanted to to um, thank you for 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 all of, of your um, for the conversation for all of, of your content. One last question is: if people want to connect with you and to find you, what are the best places to do so? Yeah, sure. So I'm mostly on Twitter at Norman Cella. And I guess one way to look at what I do or what I write about, etc., is to go to that's the norm.com. That's like the simplest pace because I mostly, all my inner workings are found there mostly. Yeah. Uh, so you can probably find me there or like DM me or something, then we can talk more. Yeah. Thing. Perfect. Thank you, Norm. There would be a bunch of other questions I would love to ask you, but I'll leave them to the second episode. Uh, uh, once again, thank you so much. It was a real pleasure. Uh, and I hope to see you uh, soon. To everyone listening, thank you so much. You can follow uh, Norman. You'll find a link in the description with all the, 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 the website, the Norm's website, Norm's Twitter, but also with all the uh, with links to all everything that we talked about in this episode and if you like what you hear please consider subscribing to the podcast on your favorite platform um podcast platform actually and i'll see you uh in the next episode thank you everyone thank you Norm.